Uh, it's a real pleasure to see so many people here today. This event has been co-hosted and organized by a number of different groups, but I wanted to quickly give a, a big special thank you and shout out to Brent Blackwelder and Randy Hayes for making this event possible today. The question for this session today is whether there is a role for the ICC, for the International Criminal Court, in advancing justice for the destruction of ecosystems and its impacts on indigenous communities. To answer this question, we have an excellent panel in place, though in the interest of modesty, I have to qualify that slightly as I will be speaking myself at the end. Um, but besides that blip, we are lucky to have Walter Feening from the Institute for Environmental Security. We have Patrick Ali from Global Witness, and we have Havina Madeira from the Center for Climate Crime Analysis. I'll be introducing each of these speakers in turn properly. But first of all, it's my absolute pleasure to introduce Nina Gualinga, who is a women defender for, of the Amazon from the Quechua community of Saracuya. Saryu, sorry, Sarayaku. She is a mother, student, and advocate for women's rights, indigenous peoples, and climate justice. And she has recently joined Amazon Watch's team as a women's defenders amb ambassador. So without further ado, I'm gonna pass over to Nina. Thank you, Nina. Thank you so much, Charlie. And um, good day to everyone attending this event that is being held at the 19th Assembly of the State Parties of the Rome Statue of the International Criminal Court. Um, what I'm gonna say now is no surprise for anyone. Uh, we're at a tipping point and forests have been exploited, burned in every corner. Natural resources like oil, gas, timber are taken by the minute by extractive companies causing enormous harm to the earth, to animals and people. In March this year, my community of Sarayaku in the Ecuadorian Amazon, who has been defending uh, the land, keeping fossil fuels in the ground and fighting extractive industries for decades, was hit by massive floods. Um, that was washed away houses, fields, crops, um, as this is a result of human driven climate change and deforestation in the headwaters. Um, massive oil spills have contaminated drinking water uh, in the Ecuador and Amazon very recently. Mining and deforestation is also putting uh, people in great danger and threatening uh, our indigenous people's ability to continue living off the land. The worst part of this is that this destruction is financed. Um, it's financed by banks, it's financed by corporations and governments um, who choose to actively continue doing this. And we indigenous people have been living in deep connection with the earth for generations, a relationship of taking and giving back, a relationship of symbiosis and balance. And for us, nature is alive. And my community of Sarayaku, we call this the living forest, the forest the rivers, the mountains, the oceans, the animals, our communities, the stones, everything is alive from the smallest creature to the biggest. And we humans are only part of this, this entire um, worldwide ecosystem that is interconnected and indigenous communities across the world are fighting to protect our territories, are fighting to protect life on earth. And for this, we have been persecuted, we have been criminalized, we have been tortured, raped and murdered. And that is a reality today. That is what indigenous people face on a daily basis. But we must continue protecting and respecting nature because we depend on what nature gives us. We all do, you do too. Nature, Mother Earth, Pachamama, 
is the source of all life here. Our earth is a living organism, which we are part of. And our earth, nature speaks, communicates. Did you know that in the Amazon rainforest, um, when the frogs sing at night, they tell us about what the weather will be like in the following days. Just like the crickets sing when the darkness is coming and the colibri warns people if there's a snake nearby so that we can be cautious. All of this indigenous people know because we have been living in the forest for generations and passing on this knowledge um, from generation to generation. And today we are seeing wildfires across the Amazon, across California. We're seeing glaciers melting in the north. We're seeing sea levels rising. And for anyone who is listening, for anyone who understands the language of earth, she is speaking clearly. Stop killing. Killing the very source of life our earth, nature, is a crime. It is a crime on every level. It is a crime against the living forest. It is a crime against future generations. It is a crime against nature. It is a crime against humanity. So we must criminalize ecocide at national and international level. And that is the responsibility of those people who have the power to do that. Thank you. Thank you so much for that presentation, Nina. I really appreciate it and, and for providing the framing for the rest of our discussion. Um, I'm sure there are a lot of questions for Nina. I would ask that you hold on to those questions until we've reached the end of the panel discussion as there's quite a lot to get through. Um, it's my pleasure to now shift things over to the panel. Um, we're hoping to keep these presentations short. So advance warning, I'll be cutting in if we go too far beyond the 10 minute mark. Uh, but with that in mind, I'm going to hand over to Valta Wiening. Valta has worked in environmental policy and advocacy for five decades now. First as a policy advisor for the Dutch Ministry of the Environment, and then as director of IUCN Netherlands and now as president of the Institute for Environmental Security. Uh, Wout has long been involved in the ecocide campaign and continues to focus primarily on the destruction of essential ecosystems, such as the Amazon and the rights of their inhabitants. If you do have any questions during the period of, or during Wouter's uh, uh, um, presentation, do feel free to use the Q&A function at the bottom. Um, we'll be using that to monitor questions. You can. Uh, like a comment, uh, in which case it will go to the top of the screen and we'll make sure that that does get asked at the end of the presentations. But before then, I'm going to pass over to Wouter. Thank you, Wouter. Thank you, Charlie, for your uh, introduction. And uh, thank you, Nina, for your very powerful introductory statement, which really gives the inspiration for this uh, meeting and uh, for our follow-up action. Uh, I greet you from uh, The Hague which is uh, an international city for peace, justice and security and also strives to be uh, the legal capital of the world. Uh, that's the place where the courts are to, to uh, enforce existing law. And of course, we hope and that's the aim of this uh, meeting, uh, this online meeting uh, to, to, uh, to make uh, ecocide a, 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 a vital element of international law. Um, <clears throat> Um, I'm going to focus on a very concrete situation where ecocide is taking place, which is uh, Venezuela, uh, especially the part uh, which is south uh, uh, of the uh, Orinoco River, uh, basically the, the Venezuelan Amazon. Uh, we just heard from Nina about the Ecuadorian Amazon. Uh, Venezuelan Amazon is also under the greatest threat, as I will uh, uh, illustrate a bit. Um, <clears throat> Um, and and um, it's a concrete example of ecocide. Um, and, and what we are trying to do with this meeting is, of course, to, to, to make clear that ecocide is a crime that needs to be prosecuted at the highest level, 
at the level of the International Criminal Court, which is the global level. Um, and the global level also is very important to inspire and to make national courts uh, also do work on, on ecocide. And uh, we are happy now that in France, uh, ecocide has been recognized in national uh, legislation as an uh, as a, not as a crime as such, but as a very serious offense, uh, which can be punished by, 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 by prison for 10 years maximum. So that's a solid case of criminal justice uh, on the level of, uh, of ecocide. Um, and we are, at this moment, of course, we are uh, very happy that there's a team of eminent lawyers, which is uh, working to define ecocide. Side, uh, as an operational uh, crime in international law. Uh, I personally think we already have some definitions which are workable and I think everybody knows, uh, you know, more or less precisely what is ecocide, you know, you, you understand the, the intentional destruction of large ecosystems. But if you're going to prosecute uh, a crime, then you really need a very solid legal definition in the books, otherwise courts cannot act. So we are happy uh, and we hope that uh, this team of lawyers will come up soon with a uh, good definition, which can become part of the Statute of Rome. Um, the situation in Venezuela is a uh, excellent, if you wish, excellent between quotation marks, example of, uh, of occurring ecocide. Uh, we have illegal mining there uh, and they do the following. They and invade the ancestral lands of indigenous communities without the permission of the uh, local communities and authorities. They destroy the vegetation and the agricultural plots uh, with the heavy machinery the mining uh, is uh, bringing to those uh, areas. Um, they poison the waters of the communities with mercury. Uh, you may know mercury is used to isolate the gold from the ore. Uh, and it's uh, mercury, of course, is one of the most uh, toxic uh, chemicals in the world. It's uh, also, it doesn't break down. So any molecule of mercury in the environment stays there forever and it builds up, and builds up. So it's portioning the, the local situation and in the end also the global situation. Um, you, they poison the waters with the, the mercury so it becomes uh, undrinkable for the local communities. And the fish they, 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 they live off you know, also become uneatable uh, because of the content of, uh, of, of mercury. And, and uh, it, it's, uh, it's a thing which uh, has to stop as soon as possible because it only builds up uh, as, as, as we go on. Um, the, and one of the, the issues uh, which is also there with the water is that uh, streams which run are being turned into stagnant waters in the mining situation and the stagnant waters are sources of malaria for the malaria mosquito and, and uh, Venezuela already had a problem of malaria but now that is really exacerbated in a very serious way. Uh, so it's a whole, whole, uh, whole set of, of very serious uh, criminal uh, activities uh, which have serious impact on the health of nature, uh, the environment, and uh, the uh, local communities. Um, what also is happening is that uh, the local communities are forced uh, with violent means to work for the mining uh, uh, operations, um, and, and, and there is abuse and rape of the women and girls in the community because, you know, they are forced to, 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 uh, uh, to, to be of service to the, to the miners. In, 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 in all kinds of ways. Um, <clears throat> and, and you know, this situation shows that, that ecocide is both a part of already existing uh, international crime uh, legislation, um, because if you destroy the environment upon which the livelihoods of a people uh, depend, you are destroying that community as such. You're committing genocide as well. And genocide is a recognized international crime since the Second World War. Rape and abuse of women and girls is a crime against humanity and is as such listed in the Statute of Rome, which underlies the International Criminal Court. So ecocide is already there, you may say, uh, but of course there is a very good cause to make it also a very explicit crime. Uh, but we can also uh, at this moment already proceed on the basis of what we have 
again, topping it up with a explicit crime, uh, ecocide crime uh, is, is, uh, is really an addition, uh, essential addition to international uh, criminal law. Um, <clears throat> the sad thing is that um, ecocide, was not called ecocide at the time, it was already part in 1998 of the Rome Statute when uh, the, 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 the diplomacy was deciding upon uh, that uh, statute. And then that was taken away uh, out of uh, the text of uh, the Statute of Rome uh, by four countries, the US, the UK, France, and I'm sorry to say my own country, the Netherlands. Uh, I think it's a very shameful uh, discussion then. Um, and I would like very much uh, that from our side and from, from the legal science, uh, uh, there would be a, uh, you know, a really a deep uh, investigation into why that happened. And, and uh, so uh, if you talk about ecocide, it's really repairing the, the original statute of Rome uh, instead of maybe adding something new. Um, <clears throat> I'm now going to focus on um, uh, the situation in uh, Otana region in the uh, uh, state of Amazonas um, <clears throat> of Venezuela, um, where you have uh, illegal mining and where there is a situation uh, where also foreign miners are uh, implicated. Um, remnants of the FARC, the Colombian guerrilla and the ELN, the Colombian guerrilla, are also now engaged in mining uh, and, and they are causing uh, uh, conflicts, internal conflicts uh, between uh, the various segments of the Piaroa community, which is living there, the beautiful part of the world near the Orinoco River. Uh, and, and they are doing some kind of a divide and conquer. They, they, they make some of the young generation you know, become complicit in the, um, in, the, uh, uh, in the illegal mining and, and in the self-destruction, you may say, of the area. Um, you can find uh, the situation uh, very well explained in, a, uh, in one of the best sources of the ecocide uh, on, uh, in Venezuela, which is uh, the website uh, of SOS Orinoco. So if you take anything away from this, uh, from my presentation, www.sosorinoco.org is a great source of information uh, on ecocide in Venezuela. And um, uh, they have direct contacts with uh, the local communities there uh, who can report directly on the ecocide which is being brought upon them. Uh -huh. So um, I think my time is, uh, is ending at this moment, yeah? One more minute. I have one more minute. Um, there's much to say about Venezuela because it's uh, it's very rich, quotation marks, you know, as to a criminal situation. Um, we need to do everything we can to make uh, it an operational uh, case for the International Criminal Court. So we should go on uh, with uh, preparing a case according to the, uh, the, the uh, demands of the uh, Statute of Rome. Uh, we should hear directly, as we did for Nina, from the local communities. Um, we should present uh, the case also on the basis of uh, satellite monitoring. And at the moment, the last thing I'm going to say is that we are uh, engaged uh, to, uh, with a company in, in Germany to have the European Space Agency make very high resolution images of where the actual mining is taking place, where the sources of the uh, mercury pollution are, also to make uh, an analysis of the, uh, of the pollution, how serious is it, um, and, and, and together with uh, the local communities, together with science, we should present a case for the International Criminal Court of Ecocide uh, as, a, uh, as a, a, a truly essential addition uh, for the future uh, of ourselves, the planet, and in this case, uh, with the special recognition of the plight of the indigenous communities who are both victims now, but if they are uh, recognized in their rights, they are one of the power, most powerful defenders of the ecosystems uh, of which, on which uh, all life uh, depends. Thank you very much. Thank you, Valter. Um, again, a reminder that if you do have questions for Valter, please put it in the Q&A at the bottom of the screen. Um, we will be monitoring that and will uh, ask questions if they're specific or to the panel as a whole at the end. 
But until then, I'm going to move on to our second speaker. And the second speaker here is Patrick Alley. Uh, Patrick co-founded Global Witness in 1995 and now serves there as a board director. Patrick has taken, um, has since taken part in over 50 field investigations and associated advocacy campaigns and focuses in particular on corruption, conflict resources, forest and land and environmental defenders. Patrick, over to you. Thank you. Um, on the, well, first of all, I'd like to say thank you to the previous panelists, uh, especially Nino. I'm always humbled hearing that the first hand experience of people at the sharp end of the problems we're facing. Um, on the 26th of April 2012, a, a former colleague at Global Witness, a Cambodian forest activist called Chut Vuti, was murdered. And this was the first person that I knew personally to be killed for doing their work. And of course, we knew about the killings of indigenous peoples and activists, but we asked ourselves just how many are being killed. And we decided then to research this and since then have produced an annual report documenting the killings of, of land and environmental defenders. A couple of years later, after Vuti died on Earth Day, April 2015, we launched our report for 2014 in Washington, DC. And I sat on the panel next to Berta Caceres, who had just won the Goldman Prize for her work opposing the Aguazaca hydroelectric, hydroelectric Dam in Honduras. And 11 months later, she too was murdered in a hit organized by the dam building company and carried out by a bunch of gunmen, including US trained military personnel. And our most recent report um, for 2019 showed that the 212 land and environmental defenders were killed last year, more than half of them in just two countries, Colombia and the Philippines. Many more are facing non-lethal attacks and criminalization. And on average, four people a week have been murdered since the Paris Agreement was signed in 2015. I'd stress that this, these figures are minimum figures. The real numbers are undoubtedly far higher. We simply don't have all of the data we need. But the main mes message is clear, which is that the killings are rising year on year. Why? Well, capitalism has become increasingly predatory and no part of the world is safe from it. The Arctic, the tropical forests, the oceans, the seabeds. Corporations have become more powerful than governments and can lobby for the laws they want. Failing that, they bribe officials so they can evade the law. And if the worst comes to the worst and they still get caught, they can deploy their vast resources and tie the legal system up in knots for years and enjoy effective impunity. To compound this problem, corrupt governments can make bad laws or refuse to enforce existing ones. The, de the depressing record of Bolsonaro's government in Brazil is one of opening up indigenous territories to oil, mining, ranching and other exploitation and encouraging violence against the people who live there. And the result, of course, is that those who stand in the way are ruthlessly attacked and criminalized. And all the while, we've all hurtled into the severest crisis that humanity has ever faced. The climate crisis, the biodiversity crisis and the sixth extinction event the COVID pandemic, and as a zoonotic disease, it's a stark warning of the results of humankind's exploitative relationship with the environment, regardless of cost. Although we know we can't win the battle against climate change if we lose the tropical forests, we're still letting agribusinesses destroy them to produce beef or palm oil or soy. We know that the Amazon is approaching a tipping point when it loses up to around 40% of its original extent, it'll turn into dry savanna and release billions of tons of CO2 into the atmosphere and change the weather systems across Latin America. And we know, as Nina has said, that the best protectors of this land are the people who have always lived there, the land and environmental defenders. I had the privilege of speaking with Sonia Guajajara, a prominent indigenous leader from Brazil recently, and she said, you know, we, the indigenous people today are 5% of the world's population, yet we protect 82% of the biodiversity stood alive in the world. And she also said, those who protect the most are the ones who are dying the most. The usual story 
is that the government awards rights to land to a corporation without the consent of the people. And more often than not, these deals are corrupt. And because they're corrupt, then the people affected find out that law enforcement is against them, the government is against them, the judicial system is against them. And added to that is the prevalence of organized crime in all of those activities. So their only course, recourse is to protest, to become defenders. And for this, they're met with murder, violence and criminalization. So around the world, we've all become spectators of our own downfall. The perpetrators and the aiders and abettors of ecocide are perfectly visible. For example, last year, Global Witness investigated the financing of six huge agribusinesses responsible for deforestation in the Amazon, the Congo Basin, and in Papua New Guinea. Between 2013 to 19, just these six companies were backed to the tune of $44 billion by over 300 investment firms, banks, and pension funds headquartered across the globe. And you know the names, Barclays, Deutsche Bank, HSBC, Santander, Standard Chartered, and then the investment banks like JP Morgan Chase, Goldman Sachs, Bank of America, and Morgan Stanley. And of course, there's BlackRock, one of the most powerful financial institutions in the world, which held $218 million of stock in JBS, Brazil's biggest beef company, the fifth largest food company on the planet. It's corporations like these, plus the governments under whose laws they operate, that either directly or indirectly are getting away with murder. Literally, they're getting away with ecocide. And who's paying? According to a 2016 report by TrueCost for the United Nations Environment Program, the environmental costs externalized by companies globally was $7.3 trillion a year. And whilst the rich world consumes most of the products from these companies, the costs are primarily borne by the global south. But of course, it's not just about the money, it's about the violence, and it's about the irreversible destruction of our environment. And this is why we need an ecocide law. The world has changed since Nuremberg and the Rome Statute. The future of so many species and of humanity itself is being threatened by our own environmental stupidity and short night sightedness. Those people who make the decisions to enjoy the environment need to know that there isn't just a financial cost or not even just a legal cost, but a personal cost. That company bosses can also be tried for crimes against humanity. The bosses of fossil fuel companies like Exxon or Shell, who continue to look for oil and gas that we know we can't burn if we're to avoid catastrophic climate change. Or companies like Texaco and Chevron, who've polluted vast areas of the Amazon in Ecuador indeed, and not only haven't paid the vast course judgment, court judgments against them, but have pursued those who would challenge them with a religious zeal worthy of the Spanish Inquisition. But it isn't all doom. I'm constantly inspired by the people I work with across the world. I'm inspired by the people on this panel and I'm inspired by the people who've tuned in to watch this because I know we can win this fight. And I'd like to finish with some words from Sonia Guajajara, um, mirroring a little bit what, what Nina said. The idea of development that has been generated to meet the goals of capitalism sees development as a synonym of deforestation as a synonym of destruction. So it cannot think of development as protecting forests or valuing natural wealth. The thinking is of development with tractors going through and pulling everything down and bringing more machines and more businesses. What you get is progress that does not value people. It is progress based on the destruction of the environment, expelling people and increasing inequality. The more there is investment in the profit of big corporations, the more inequality increases, the more social inequality increases. So we indigenous activists, she said, are also seen as opposition to development because protecting forests and the environment is seen as primitive and indigenous lands therefore seen as unproductive areas. So they want at any cost to make a national plan to utilize those lands 
as if these lands, by remaining untouched, would not bring benefits, when the truth is that this is exactly what guarantees life on the planet. Thank you. Thanks so much, Patrick. Um, next up on the panel, we have Hevina Madeira, uh, who leads the Center for Climate Crimes Analysis in Initiative on, in Brazil on illegal de deforestation in the Amazon. Uh, Havina is a Brazilian lawyer with a master's degree in human rights from the University of Vienna, and she previously worked with environmental NGOs uh, supporting the protection of natural biomes and in state and federal, federal law enforcement agencies in Brazil. So Havina, over to you. Great, thank you. So I'd like to start off by saying that I'm terribly conscious about how my voice sounds. I am dealing with a terrible flu right now, but it's not COVID, just reassuring everyone here. Um, so I'm going to be speaking specifically about the Amazon rainforest in Brazil, but I also wanted to say that it's an honor to me to go and speak after such amazing panelists, after the inspiring words of Nina, and especially after the very inspiring, powerful words of Sonia Guajajara from Brazil. So I'm going to share my screen with you now so that you can perhaps have a look at some of the data. Um, and insights from our work in Brazil. So basically what we're looking at here um, is the Amazon rainforest. I'm going to be using some of the photos of our um, partners, the Repórter Brasil, which are investigative journalists who are doing the very important mission to make um, triggering information publicly available. This photo represents some of the pressure vectors that we deal in our investigation, our work in the Amazon, which is illegal logging. So what you can see here is a scar in the forest, which is highly indicative that logging is taking place in an unsustainable manner. So going forward, um, touching base on the situation of where we stand with the first station in Brazil at the moment. I'd like to say that given the enormous complexity of all the altars, of the actors and factors involved, it is any attempt to homogenize, to speak of the first station in a uniform way, um, it would be incorrect. But three generalizations do stand out, which I think that are very important, especially for the law enforcement discussions. So the first one is that approximately, and actually according to the most recent data, more than 90% of the first station in Brazil right now is illegal. And that is according to what Brazilian law defines as legal and illegal suppression of vegetation. So when I say that more than 90% of deforestation happening in the Amazon right now is illegal, I mean that more than 90% of the, of the forest land that was now converted to another use was done so in an unauthorized way, does not have an authorization from the government. Sadly, even though illegal, um, this collective and individual behaviors to clear forest land, to invade forest lands, goes largely unpunished. So what you can see is that there is a, gen, a very dangerous correlation between the lack of law enforcement, especially on the ground, and the deforestation control. So if you look at 2019, for example, we have the year with the lowest rate of environmental monitoring in the ground by the federal organs. And that is also the year in which you have deforestation reaching its highest rate of the last 10 years. So these were all um, very important insights that we, um, that we have been studying in the Amazon. And um, it's also important to say, this is probably the, the worst, the, the third bad news that I have. And the, um, another generalization is that deforestation is right now out of control in Brazil, in the Amazon. And this right, right now, what we have, um, you know, incorporating the last data from the official monitoring system is the worst rate in the last 12 years. And this is, can be perceived only after six months after the presence of the armed forces in the Amazon, which is a, a government choice. So this clearly means, I mean, it's, this is not going to sound uh, used to you, but this rate is 2.8 times higher than the target that we have set on our international agreements with, for climate uh, mitigation. So our, um, the commitments that we would have that, you know, that what we could do to sort of tackle this right now in the, in the next 10 years is not going to, right now it doesn't, it's definitely very far to, to be reached. So 
just going more and looking at another photos from the Amazon and from the ground here where you can see his trucks driving with illegally logged timber at night. Um, this could be from protected areas, it could be from uh, um, indigenous lands. What we have noticed studying the supply chain of timber in Brazil is that timber still is produced with a higher rate of illegality. So for example, in Pará, which is the highest state, uh, the, 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 the state in the Amazon that has the highest production of timber, it has a consistent rate of 70% of illegalities. So 70% of the land that is being logged is also, doing so, is also being done in an unauthorized manner. Um, but obviously timber is not the, the main commodity responsible for deforestation. This was also highlighted by Patrick. So what we have in the Amazon right now is actually that the, the forest land is being converted into pasture. This is the last step of the deforestation um, process because then you have the consolidated deforestation. And um, I also wanted to bring this photo from Xingu, which is a region under intense pressure in the Amazon. So this photo is actually um, very, at least for me, it's very overwhelming because you can see the smokes. You know that um, that over the last year there were a lot of fires were under were out of control in the Amazon, and so this is a photo in the Xingu that was sad by some of the people who lived there. It seemed like the end of the world was arriving. And um, just, you know, leaving a little bit of the, you know, talking about pressure vectors and the, the supply chain commodities pressure. Um, there are also types of deforestation factors that are affecting the indigenous land such as large scale um, enterprises, but also illegal mining. So this is a photo in the Kayapa indigenous land who are suffering a lot from illegal mining specifically. But this map for me um, actually tells a happy story. <laughs> uh, it tells a very sad story, but also a happy story. And for me, it, it sort of gives a visual and shows what Patrick was just telling us about how indigenous people actually hold the highest portion of the land that is actually protected. So what you can see in this map, and I'm very sorry for my, um, uh, six skills, but what we I try to do here really quickly for you now is that I we cross the last data of the first station from two weeks ago with indigenous lands only. So what you can see in as red is a deforestation frontier, and what you can see here, you know, specifically these lands right here in the middle in yellow, they're all indigenous lands. So here, this is the Amazon, and all the the lands that are limited with and um, yellow, they're all the indigenous lands. And it's very visible to me, for example, looking at this map, that when you're looking at this, there's really no question about how indigenous lands are the case of success of controlling deforestation. And that is because of what Nina was explaining before, because indigenous communities have a special relationship to the land. They don't see it as a resource, they see it as a home. So this is, I mean, for me, this is the major importance why we need to defend their rights. So um, I'd like to give a zoom here in this, this part of the, of the territory that is very amidst and in the middle of the deforestation pressure right now. And here I'm highlighting two um, indigenous lands where we have some of the um, most important partnerships and work conducted in the ground, which is Cachoeira Seca and Itunitata. These lands are on the top three of the most deforested indigenous lands. And what I want to, the message I'm, I'm trying to pass here is that when you study what types of pressure vectors are acting on that land, you really have the most clear um, indication of who are the people you need to be looking at and targeting if you want to tackle deforestation. So for example, uh, these two lands are very heavily affected by the large scale enterprise of the Belo Monte Dam, which was implemented without the necessary environmental impact uh, mitigation measures. And what is happening now is that there, there an intense deforestation pressure. Um, here what you have is the advance of occupation in the area and facilitating more exploratory activities. 
So for example, in Cachoeira Seca, you have indigenous leaders who are constantly reporting to the government that they see trucks like the one you saw in the photo at night who are doing illegal extraction of timber. And um, what I also wanted to say is that these types of invasions, you know, for logging timber, for um, illegally occupying land and grazing cattle, they're also opening and paving the way to more violence and more exposure of indigenous people to infectious diseases. And so, you know, giving a, another number on the situation of the violence in Brazil right now, when you look at the data, which I, I believe should was probably one of the sources also for Global Witness Studies, which is the Indigenous Missionary Council. So they comprise data of the official data from the Special Secretariat of Health and Indigenous here in Brazil. And only in the last year, you have more than 100 Indigenous people being killed. And the majority of these killings are linked to the fact that these people represented leaders in their communities. Their, um, their, the assassination is linked to their fight to the demarcation of their territories. And some homicides are also related to conditions of vulnerability of communities that are in degraded area or reserves that are overpopulated or near cities where these people are exposed to alcohol, alcoholism, trafficking and prostitution. So when you look at Cachoeira Seca, you have one of the biggest roads in the Amazon, which is the Transamazonica. And there's also where you have the highest deforestation and invasion pressure. So as you can see, it's very harmful for indigenous lands to be too close of urban areas. Um, the Itoneta da indigenous land, it's also important because this is a, a land that is under a type of special protection. It has people on voluntary isolation. And um, we are on this specific land. We are developing a project together with the coordination of the indigenous people of the Amazon basin to compile a database that allows them not to only detect and monitor deforestation because that technology is available, but they, that's not only what they wanna know, they wanna know who is behind it. So this really goes in the same um, line of what I was saying before, that these people are extremely um, politically and active in denouncing what's happening to their land. So this is something that we hope to be able to build together very soon. And um, I'd like to conclude this, um, my presentation with saying that um, what we can see is that this larger, you know, this large scale destruction in the Amazon rainforest and other types of natural biomes, they're devastating the lives of the people, of the forest people. Right now, I'm using, I'm borrowing an expression from our greatest environmental activist, Chico Mages, who was murdered by um, the farmers who opposed the fight that he led with the, the association of rubber tappers in Pará. And the forest people goes beyond the, just, uh, the indigenous communities. There are also the river people, the Quilombola people, the extractive, the extractive communities. And these people, they're not only active and political about their fight, but they also should be sitting at the table in any type of international dialogue that aims to bring solutions. So this is really what we believe that can bring a change in the situation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Havain, and I very much hope you get better soon. Um, I understand Nina uh, needs to go at 1 p.m., so I'm going to briefly interrupt proceedings here to ask the first question from Q&A, which is directed at Nina. If that's okay, Nina, the, the question is, um, do you have a view uh, on the granting of legal rights to nature? Um, how has this played out in Ecuador? Thank you. Um, thanks for the question. So the Ecuadorian constitution recognized the rights of nature. Um, and it's a, it's a beautiful constitution um, with beautiful laws. But this has not been applied um, in real life. And as we can see every day, um, Ecuador continues destroying the Amazon rainforest, continues uh, polluting the water. I mean, just recently we had a massive oil spill that could have been prevented, 
um, there were various reports that were made that um, they, there might be a possible oil pipeline rupture, um, but the Ecuadorian government uh, or Petro Ecuador or Petro Amazonas, which is the same company, um, did not listen and did not take any measures at all uh, to prevent this. And now you have you know, one of two of the main rivers, uh, Napo and Coca, um, in the Ecuadorian Amazon that have been yeah, flooded with oil and toxic, um, uh, toxic wastewater from, from this uh, pipeline. Um, and completely, you know, in the middle of a pandemic, um, basically, yeah, the people don't have access to clean water or any food security. Um, they have become sick uh, because of uh, because they have been bathing in the river um, and things like that. So, I mean, every day we just see again and again that we have this beautiful constitution, but it's not being implemented. And um, I think, therefore, it is important that there there is like international pressure and that, that there are international standards um, as well. Um, yeah, that's what I can say. And, and also just to add to this, the fact that, you know, we have rights of nature, but those who are really protecting these rights, um, those who are really protecting nature are indigenous people. And once again, the consequence of um, being the protector or uh, of, of these rights um, is dangerous. It's dangerous. Um, it's exhausting and it's a struggle every day. Thank you so much, Nina. <clears throat> much appreciated. Uh, and thank you for your very powerful presentation earlier. Um, I'm going to move back on with the, the presentation. We will be getting back to the q and I'm, I'm going to attempt now the unenviable task of tying together these very powerful presentations under the current legal framework of the Rome Statute at the ICC um, and explain how uh, we believe that justice can be advanced uh, for these crimes under the ICC. So uh, first of all, a little bit of an introduction. My name is Charlie Holt. I work as a legal counsel for Greenpeace International. The particular emphasis of my work is on deforestation uh, and exploring potential legal avenues for advancing justice for environmental crimes. Alas, this picture is not of me. I spend most of my time sitting in this chair here. In, in my makeshift office. Um, I first joined Greenpeace in 2015, uh, and since then the ICC has been, has been a very core part of, of my work. A, a few months after I joined, we, we were invited to an NGO round table on what was then a draft policy paper on case selection and prioritization issued by the Office of the Prosecutor of the ICC. Um, and the inclusive nature of this consultation process, you can see uh, here it's referred to in this quote from Fatih Ben Souda, who's the ICC chief prosecutor. Um, we found this itself encouraging in terms of signaling a potential shift in the direction of the ICC. Uh, this was followed by uh, the publication in November 2016 of the document itself. And it's worth spending just a bit of time on this, as there are a number of misconceptions that uh, continue to circulate about exactly what this document does and does not signify. As we'll see from some of the headphones, the headlines at the time, Greenpeace, Greenpeace was not the only group which was encouraged by this policy paper. And there are a number of uh, perhaps overexcited headlines, um, which in some circles inflated expectations about what this represented. So just to highlight the relevant text here, which mentioned environmental destruction. I think the last line here is key. The Office of the Prosecutor would give particular consideration to prosecuting Rome statute crimes committed by means of all that result in environmental destruction. So while we understand that this does not represent a departure from the existing case law of the court, it, it doesn't, contrary to the, what the Washington Post say, mean that environmental destruction is now a crime against humanity. We did take this as a signal that the ICC would be more receptive to taking forward investigations into environmental crimes. Um, and in response, we therefore put together a brief uh, for campaigners on, uh, on across the global Greenpeace network for them asking them to refer cases our way. 
the main focus of this brief was on crimes against humanity. And I hate to just copy and paste a dense piece of legal text here, but I think it's, it's quite helpful to put it up on screen. Uh, in the Rome Statute itself, that's the treaty which underpins the ICC, the word environment appears only once, and that is in the context of war crimes, specifically long-term and severe damage to the environment in the course of a military attack. And this is obviously very limiting, but at the same time, large scale acts of environmental destruction, as we've heard from the previous speakers, almost invariably entail the commission of one or more of the crimes you see on screen. So for example, where we have large scale uh, acts of deforestation, uh, you will generally have acts of uh, forced displacement, forced removal of those who, who exist on those, who, who live on those uh, areas of land. Likewise, when you have uh, toxic contamination of water or of land, uh, you will likely have uh, instances of intense suffering. Uh, and uh, if the person responsible is aware of that intense, that that intense suffering is likely to occur as a result of their activities, you likely have inhumane acts, which you'll see at the bottom of this page. The crucial thing here is intent though. And that's where we really hit up against the limitations of the law. Uh, the crimes here have to be pursuant to a part or have to be part of rather a, a broader attack and this attack needs to be pursuant to an organizational or a state policy and that policy requires the organization in question whether it's a state or whether it's a corporation to actively promote or encourage that attack and it's these difficulties that really uh, drives the campaign for an ecocide amendment to the Rome Statute, along with the fact which is often highlighted that uh, the that crimes against humanity uh, are inherently anthropocentric, meaning they're inherently focused on human life. Uh, a crime against humanity is a crime against humanity. It involves the targeting of a civilian population. As I say, most acts of environmental destruction involve that. And, and this, this, this session today is obviously looking at the impact uh, environmental destruction has almost invariably on indigenous populations or others. But again, it's that targeting which can be difficult to, to prove. It's perhaps worth highlighting at this point a case of environmental destruction that wasn't successful, and wasn't investigated by the ICC, but really should have been uh, pursued in the ICC had things been differently. And that's the case of Texaco's oil dumping in the Ecuadorian Amazon. It, it's often termed the environmental Chernobyl. Um, and that was where Texaco, which merged with Chevron in 2001, dumped more than 16 billion gallons of oil in Ecuador's Amazon region of Lago Agrio. Um, just to give some idea, that is, 80 times more oil than BP's Deepwater Horizon oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico in 2010. Um, water from communities near the oil fields were found to have contamination up to 288 times the limit permitted by the EU, to give an idea of that. And that inevitably led to the killing of local fish and cattle, which then of course had impacts to, the, to those indigenous communities who were reliant on those sources of water and food. Um, but it also led more directly to human harm, to significantly increased rates of cancer, uh, miscarriages and other health problems. As I put here, excess mortality rates were estimated to be 30 to 130%. That's 30, 130% more than the normal rate of any given year. Uh, and uh, more than 30,000 indigenous residents displaced, killed or otherwise impacted. So I highlight this case because it really is, or really should be the paradigmatic case of environmental destruction uh, to be fired at the ICC. It was, however, rejected uh, by the ICC the following year. Um, just put here a, a line from the dismissal letter. It was rejected on two grounds, under temporal and subject matter jurisdiction. And just to explain what those terms mean, temporal jurisdiction meant that the core crimes it was referring to took place prior to 2002. 2002 is when Ecuador ratified the Rome Statute. And that is, it's only after 2002, therefore, that the court uh, had jurisdiction of what happened. Uh, subject matter jurisdiction is perhaps more interesting. The letter did not go into detail about exactly what that involves. Um, now, the argument that individual liability for the oil dumping extended to the present day due to Chevron's inaction 
was always going to be difficult. Um, but fairly or not, this, this decision was taken as, as reaffirming the court's reluctance to tackle environmental crimes and therefore further underscored the need for an ecocide amendment. But I would like to just quickly look <clears throat> at a case that we think can and should be pursued under the existing framework of the ICC. It's the case that kept being referred to me and to us at the legal unit uh, after we sent out the brief to our campaigners. And it's really the case that prompted my involvement in, in all of this. And it's the case which Patrick highlighted, which Havina spoke extensively about, and that is of course Brazil. Um, We've already heard about the desperate situation in Brazil for indigenous and traditional communities, but I'd like to explain briefly why uh, uh, we think that Brazil should be made subject to the jurisdiction of the court. So I think the first thing is that we have multiple instances of forced displacement, of murder, of persecution, um, violent land invasions, associated indigenous rights violations, uh, and more committed pursuant to a state policy. Now it's this state policy is, is a policy to expand uh, agribusiness, infrastructural products, mining activities into indigenous lands at any cost. Um, and uh, just uh, one thing I'd say is this is a, a, a policy which precedes the Bolsonaro administration, but which has been made really transparently clear as a result of the hateful rhetoric of Bolsonaro and others. Uh, and, and, and the fact that much of the, the, you know, the sort of more the talk about a, a, a environmental, or sorry, a, a, of economic development really has been uh, stripped bare as being ultimately about uh, clearing the way for uh, the, the government to enter into indigenous land. The second thing is something that we've already talked about is a very obvious environmental damage here which, as I said in the first slide, uh, can really be used under existing policy to underscore the gravity of the situation in Brazil. I mean, there are a number of different statistics we can point to about the scale of the destruction in Brazil. And we've already seen graphically represented in Havina's uh, presentation, what that destruction looks like. But it's worth saying, for example, that in the period between August 2019 and July 2020, an area one third the size of Belgium, well, Belgium was raised in that one year alone. So it really is an enormous destruction. Finally, the reason why I believe that this case ticks all the boxes of an ICC communication is that you have a civilian population here being targeted directly, both on a state level uh, and on an individual level. Uh, indigenous and traditional communities in these areas are being treated essentially as disposable obstacles to development, or rather, let's be honest here, to profit. And the discriminatory and assimilationist rhetoric of government figures, particularly under Bolsonaro, particularly Bolsonaro himself, really serves to underscore this. So yes, there is a strong case under the existing Rome Statute to hold members of the Brazilian government and corporations who have facilitated the crimes to account for the crimes taking place in the Amazon. That's not to say there aren't limitations inherent in the current framework that need to be addressed. Um, and we certainly share the belief that large scale environmental uh, destruction should be characterized as crimes, irrespective of, that, it, 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 of whether that destruction directly targets civilian populations. And therefore I really do applaud the developments of the Stop Ecocide campaign. And I'm going to go to the questions. And the first of these questions is helpfully enough about the law against ecocide. So we can move quite, quite easily on from that last slide. And the question is, what do the panelists think will make this law a reality? So what will make politicians propose, support and vote for ecocide as the fifth crime against peace or pressure support, for example? Um, that's from Monica Schultz. So thank you, Monica. Uh, I'm going to stop talking. I've been talking long enough and I'm going to hand over. Does anyone in the panel like to take that question forward? I think we should continue doing what was discussed, you know, uh, at the panel, uh, uh, you know, uh, just uh, this at this moment to assemble all the facts uh, and have a scientifically based case. 
um, which uh, we are doing right now. So that, that's very good. Um, part of it also should be our advocacy uh, uh, powers we have uh, to influence our governments who are party to the Rome Statute to indeed explicitly include the crime of ecocide. Uh, in the meantime, as you were uh, saying uh, on the basis of the policy paper of September uh, 16, I think, uh, use the existing statute, but uh, had to, 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 uh, uh, to, to pursue ecocide. But again, it's too anthropocentric as you, uh, as you pointed out. Um, so advocacy to, uh, to, to the uh, members uh, states of the Assembly of State Parties to include uh, the uh, ecocide uh, as an element, explicit element in the Rome Statute. We already have a few parties, uh, as people know, uh, from, the, from the Pacific uh, countries. You know, Vanuatu has been very much at the forefront uh, to propose uh, in the Assembly of State Parties an amendment to the Rome Statute to include ecocide. Uh, France now is, uh, has ecocide in its national uh, uh, legal books. Uh, so uh, let's uh, use these governments to propose an amendment and, and uh, we are waiting for the team of, of international lawyers to, to really see what that amendment should look like in legal terms. Uh, but uh, let's uh, use all our powers to do the advocacy towards our, our ministries of foreign affairs and, uh, and of justice uh, to put um, uh, ecocide on the uh, Rome Statute books. Um, I think uh, we also have powerful allies in public opinion. Uh, the Guardian is, is a great newspaper to highlight ecocide situations. Uh, the New York Times is very good. Uh, Time Magazine and there must be other, uh, you know, uh, legal uh, major media which which can be uh, uh, used to to promote uh, the advocacy. Uh, so let's let's work on on, on various you know levels, uh, public opinion globally. Uh, legal analysis, uh, uh, satellite monitoring with precise data of where the, the actual things are happening is essential because if you are going to do something in a criminal court, you have to name and identify individuals. And, and, um, and it's very uh, necessary to identify who actually is culpable of committing ecocide. Is it only the one who is using the chainsaw or maybe killing uh, at that moment the indigenous uh, community uh, members? Or is it also, uh, as Patrick was, 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 was illustrating, you know, is it also those big companies and those who are in command of the big companies, which in the end, you know, uh, make it uh, possibly, uh, possible economically to, to have this ecocide taking place? So, so uh, those are the few points I think to 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 go from here. Thanks. Does anyone have anything to add to that on that point, Patrick? A very small addition or nuance. Uh, I think it's more than public opinion. I agree with everything Voucher said. Um, more than public opinion, it's public pressure. We have to do this. We can increasingly see the terrible terrible state that the planet is in and the impact on people um, and i think with the uh the school strikes movements greta thunberg's movement um youth movements in general that is essential that's what's going to underpin advocacy thanks patrick i'm just gonna add one thing to that very briefly uh which as i, I mentioned briefly in the last slide there has, of course, been in recent developments of a convening of an expert panel on the drafting of a definition of ecocide. And I just say about the momentum I think that is going to that, that this is going to cause behind the ecocide movement. It's going to give added credibility to the movement and, and, and added authority about this uh, about uh, that there will be this definition in place, which can be very easily slotted within the framework of the Rome Statute. But what I think, and this really does just echo what Patrick has said, so I, I don't mean to, to, to repeat it too much, but what is so important is that the impact of this is amplified and that's down to all of us to really, to really do that job of, of promoting this and, and raising awareness and putting pressure on the authorities who to, to reform. Thank you. I'm going to move to the next question. Uh, so this is a question for Val Walter, you mentioned that many of the consequences of ecocide already fall um, within the crimes established in the Rome Statute. 
Do you think that the Rome Statute already contains the tools needed to prosecute these crimes? And if not, what are the main challenges? Uh, well, I think you, <laughs> in your presentation, you made very clear that we do have this policy paper, uh, which, which uh, looks at, you know, uh, the linkages between the Rome Statute and, and environmental destruction. So that's uh, what we have already. Uh, it's just to uh, make the case to really identify uh, the details of who is uh, being uh, murdered or, or violated in his and her right, uh, fundamental rights uh, to really have a, um, uh, a case, you know, with names and, 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 uh, and, 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 and uh, responsibilities. Um, I, I mean, there's not much I can uh, add to that because uh, you have to be able to um, identify those uh, who are perpetrators. Uh, also, you may have to add, and maybe this is a thing which I can uh, say to the uh, Venezuelan case, uh, add to that case, you also have to see who is complicit, you know, and, and then we come back to the, uh, to the, the major uh, corporations. But in the case of Venezuela, for example, the, the gold is being mined there, but then it is laundered to the international market through uh, the regime of Turkey, through Erdogan, for example. He buys in somewhere, he buys the gold, and then he, he, he makes it possible that it is becoming a product which is then sold on the international uh, market, you know. Uh, and, and it's the uh, uh, Arab Emirates which are doing uh, the same thing. Uh, it's a whole bunch of uh, companies which are providing the mercury. There's a whole mercury racket, you know, and you need mercury to isolate the gold from the ore in order to, you know, make it a, a product which you can, can then uh, uh, sell or, or, or uh, you know, transport to, uh, to markets, uh, uh, illicit at first, and then maybe legalized, uh, you know, in, in the later stage. Uh, uh, those are the, 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 the elements of a uh, full-scale uh, analysis, direct perpetrators, uh, who is buying the stuff, you know, who is making it possible that the stuff is being uh, mined, you know, the, like the uh, mercury uh, trade, um, and to put that all together in a, um, in a very readable uh, uh, report. Uh, and then, you know, presented to the office of the prosecutor. Uh, I, I know in the office of the prosecutor, you know, they, they are willing to look at stuff, but that has to be very well uh, uh, based upon uh, scientific uh, facts uh, in time and place. Thank you, Dr. Um, going back to the question of ecocide, uh, uh, there's a question here about the uh, uh, COP discussions. Um, and whether or not the discussion about ecocide can be brought into the COP discussions. I don't suppose this is a question which anyone feels comfortable or, or has anything to, to add to one about, about that to answer that question. So it's, it's a tricky one. I think this is just something that we would, we would say, uh, obviously, uh, the, the more pressure is applied, uh, the better. And, and hopefully, maybe, if not this year, then next year, this will be something which will highlight it. Yes, I've, I've just said thank you, Jojo. I don't know if there's anyone in the audience who has uh, connections or has any ideas about this, but if so, please do answer that question, which is on the Q&A. There's a question here about Venezuela, which Valter, you, uh, you, you raised in your presentation, uh, but it might be something that others uh, have had thoughts about. And there's a question about the creation of an ad hoc tribunal to prosecute crimes in Venezuela. Um, do the panel think that this would be a, an efficient way to create a precedent um, or whether or not it's better to convocate another conference to extend ICC's competence on eco side? So I'd be interested to hear people's thoughts about that, about the merit to uh, creating an ad hoc tribunal in the context of Venezuela uh, next to the, the um, uh, movement to create a, a, an eco side amendment. Of course, the situation inside Venezuela is so uh, dire that uh, there is no functioning, you know, rule of law in Venezuela. It's really it's uh, one big criminal operation, 
uh, and uh, it's it's uh, dominated by the uh, secret police, uh, the security forces, uh, the military, uh, organized crime, and what I mentioned also now elements of the Colombian guerrilla. They are they are dominant on field level in Venezuela. So something inside the tribunal, inside Venezuela, is out of the question. Um, what we do have is the Inter-American uh, Commission or Court on Human Rights, uh, if I say it rightly. And, and that is a, um, a court which uh, looks at uh, uh, human rights violations uh, in, in the Americas. Uh, they did a fantastic thing on the rights of indigenous peoples in Suriname, the Sarabacanders. Uh, and you could bring uh, the, the Venezuela situation to that Inter-American uh, Court on Human Rights and have them pronounce. Uh, now, this, of course, one thing is, is a court which, uh, which uh, says something, you know, and, and has a paper verdict. And, and, and it's another thing to, to bring that verdict into practice, uh, which at this moment is extremely difficult and almost impossible in Venezuela. But you have to do whatever you can. So I would advise uh, the Inter-American Court on uh, Human Rights uh, to be approached on Venezuela. Uh, and I also would like to highlight here uh, the very important diplomatic role of the OAS, the Organization of American States, uh, which can put uh, diplomatic pressure on, uh, on the member states. And Venezuela still is officially a member state of the OAS, uh, but it's a very dysfunctional member state. But, you know, use whatever you have. And the OAS is a great diplomatic forum uh, to also pronounce on Venezuela. Thanks, Walter. I'm going to move on to a question which I think is directed to Patrick, or rather I'm, I'm going to say it is because it's such a broad and, and fundamental question and a difficult one. So, Patrick, we've got a question you mentioned about predatory capitalism. Uh, there's a question here about whether uh, how a non-predatory or exploitative form of capitalism would look like. And I think probably extending it here to the ICC, I think the question would also be whether an ecocide law would tame capitalism in a way that would contain a lot of the, the problems that we're seeing? Yeah, it's um, it's a brilliant question and a horrible one. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I think a lot of us have, have long recognised that, you know, capitalism consumption as it is, is simply unsustainable. You know, there's the Global Footprint Network, which sort of talks about how many months it takes into any new year before we actually are using resources that we don't have and, and, and are exceeding what the world can provide. Um, and I think that the, all of the problems we've been talking about on this panel are an example of this. And we simply can't carry on the way we are. You know, most economies are based on, on GDP um, and GDP growth, which essentially is predicated on unlimited growth in a finite world it simply isn't possible and, and the, the only question is you know do we try and manage that now or do we wait till we hit the buffers and so it's one of those big asks that you know has challenged me and it's challenged most of my colleagues in, in the NGO world how do you change the economic system um, and I think you know it's not going to be by being terribly nice to people and asking companies to roll back I think the way companies operate should change right now any listed company its time frame is around the three to five years from now i.e shareholder dividend that has to change companies have to have a triple bottom line which includes social and environmental benefits as well as benefits to, sh to shareholders any business that is abusing the rights of people um, whether that's simply their rights to live on the land in the way they want to or their right to live has to be unacceptable. Um, these things, and that's where I think an, a crime of ecocide can really come in because these are things that are un unarguable. In, in, in my experience at Global Witness, the campaigns that usually work, like Blood Diamonds, for example, are ones where there isn't actually a valid argument not to do it. So people might not want to do it, they might struggle not to do it, but actually in the end there is no valid argument not to do it. And I think add that to a law like ecocide um, and then you start getting somewhere. Obviously there's no not time in this to sort of, you could have a, a day's debate or a week's debate on this, but as, as a starter I'll, I'll stop at that point. Thanks so much Patrick. 
we've got an interest we've got a question here about corporate personhood um which is obviously an interesting topic to 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 raise here uh, the question is whether it would also be necessary to remove the concept of corporate legal personhood standing from international law in order to hold executives personally liable for ecocide. I would just jump in here, take my prerogative as the moderator here, just to, I think, just to help clarify things here, and maybe to, to give a slight more precision to the question, which is that uh, individual executives, as we understand it, can indeed be held accountable under the existing framework of the Rome Statute. Um, and that is, in itself, can provide a very powerful deterrent to uh, against uh, active environment destruction by corporations. In fact, often that can be a stronger deterrent than actually uh, holding corporations to account. One of the big problems we see around the world, I'm sure Patrick has lots of experience with this, is that you will hold, you will be able to uh, successfully advance criminal justice for acts of, of environment destruction against corporations. But those corporations are then easily able to absorb the costs or the sanctions they receive from that. It's when you actually target the individual executives that you can do that. And that's something you can already do. And, and I would just emphasize that. Um, and I think it's something we should already be doing. Um, but I don't know whether anyone else has other thoughts about and about, of course, that question about corporate, corporate person about whether corporations can be held li liable is obviously a separate one. And I don't know whether anyone here has thoughts about that. If not, maybe I will move on. There's a question here about shipping. Shipping has been responsible for many pollution incidents. Much of the industry is fragmented with each vessel an individual company. And the question is, can this be a way of subverting any ecocide law? So the way that shipping is structured. I was just going to say, I don't think it would subvert an ecocide law. I think it provides some loopholes, but I don't think it will prevent a law being effective. Uh, we have a question about whether, there, whether states can avoid the reach of the ICC by not being part of certain agreements. Who would like to take that forward? Well, if you're not a party to the uh, ICC, you know, you're a little bit out of reach uh, uh, of the, uh, of the, of the uh, prosecution by the court. But there is the role of the Security Council. Uh, the, the Security Council can, uh, can point to situations where uh, states which are not a party to the uh, ICC can be prosecuted for uh, crimes which are listed in the uh, Rome Statute or in interpretation of the Rome uh, Statute. Uh, I think the situation in Afghanistan, where uh, the ICC is now looking at whether American military people have committed uh, crimes, maybe under that war crime uh, chapter, you know, which you mentioned, Charlie, uh, uh, which does contain environmental uh, uh, crime. Uh, is a situation where the uh, where a state which is not a member can be investigated uh, by uh, the or uh, office of the prosecutor. Um, the thing with Venezuela, if I may come back to Venezuela, um, uh, the major supporters of the regime of Maduro, which is committing, you know, uh, really directly and, and indirectly with the Colombian guerrilla, the ecocide. Uh, that state is supported by China and Russia, and China and Russia are both members of the Security Council with veto power. Uh, so any 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 role of the Security Council, and you may think you may speculate about whether uh, there should be a peace mission to Venezuela to do re regime change. You know if that would be advisable, and and there are people who are saying that's not advisable. Um, but it, it can never be decided on the level of the Security Council because China and Russia, which have oil interests in Venezuela, uh, will always veto that. So, but yes, there is a there is a way to 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 in, to involve uh, non uh, non party states uh, in ICC procedures. Yes. So we've got a question here, an interesting question from Lucy Whelan. She says she's coming uh, at this from an environmental humanities perspective. Um, there is a debate in that field about the use of the term nature, which is often claimed to be a false term because nature is never fully separate from mankind. Is this argument ever used by aggressors as a legal excuse for their actions? Another quite complicated question, Patrick. Not in my experience, easy answer. <laughs> no, I don't think I've come across that either. Ravina, I'm not sure you had anything point there. 
Yeah, I was going to say the same. I have never actually seen that. So we have a question here about uh, how much easier it is to prosecute a country such as Venezuela and their mining rather than Australia's Great Barrier Reef and coal. I think this is a, a great question, whether or not it's easier to, to pursue um, perhaps wealthier, more powerful countries on the world stage. I don't know if anybody wants to uh, respond to that question, but maybe some of the political considerations behind this. I mean, Ravina is a lawyer, might have a, a better answer than me. I'm no lawyer, but I can see that, yes, um, to pursue a country which is more powerful on the world stage um, and perhaps obeys most of the rules is theoretically easier to go after and should be gone after. Um, but these things are rarely purely national. You know, the, the coal in Australia, look at Adani in India, who's responsible for the major, you know, Carmichael mine in Australia and the, the environmental damage that will cause. I think you should go for both. Um, it, actually, Charlie, I had a little connection issue. Could you repeat the, the full question? Sorry. So the question was about how much easier it is to prosecute a country such as Venezuela um, and their mining rather than Australia's Great Barrier Reef and Coal. And actually, I'll just extend this to the next the follow-up question, which was by the same attendee, um, uh, which is uh, how to prevent this crime simply becoming another way to support sanctions against those countries that the US government, for example, don't like. So to what extent it might become a tool just to, to hit uh, poorer and less favorable countries on the world stage. Yes, that, uh, that would be a, a concern, although I am actually more conscious of the political use that, for example, um, the Brazil government might use um, to basically avoid being subjected to such action. So um, I think that we can trust that um, the investigations are impartial and that this could be conducted properly. So we, we should be more aware of the political use of these types of um, claims than anything else. Thank you, Havina. I don't know if we have a point from Vauta. Vauta, are you speaking there? Yeah, yeah, and yeah, I'd, I'd like to, uh, uh, you know, the, the comparison between Venezuela and, and Australia, um, uh, of course, uh, in Venezuela, you know, the situation is very, very obvious. Uh, it is uh, direct uh, uh, destruction of the environment, you know, by, by uh, uh, using mercury, you know, and polluting the waters to do deforestation uh, by really directly, uh, uh, you know, by raping the women. Uh, uh, so the crimes against humanity, it's all very obvious. Uh, what's happening in the Great Barrier Reef is, of course, it's obvious that there's something is happening, but it's not an obvious direct uh, assault uh, on the ecosystem of the Great Barrier Reef. And as, as far as right now, uh, there is no crimes against humanity involved. Um, but it's a very serious situation. And if the Great Barrier Reef is, you know, is seen as one of the mainstays of the, the planetary ecology and, the, and ocean sustainability, then really, uh, if you would destroy it, and, and Adani and, and the Australian government, you know, which is complicit there, uh, knows it, uh, then, then it should be interesting to, to try to build a case against uh, Australia on the ecocide, you know, by uh, destroying the Great Barrier Reef, or putting it at such a big risk, you know, that it will disappear uh, uh, in, in the foreseeable future. So uh, it's, 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 a, it's a great question, which, which I think it would be a cue to, uh, to, 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 to pursue. Thank you, Valter. We've got a question here about the history. I don't know whether who, who would be uh, best place to uh, answer it, but I know it's an interesting one. A lot of people have, have discussed it, which is about what was it that led to ecocide being recognized, um, uh, uh, well, rather than environmental destruction being recognized as part of a, of a war crime, but not otherwise. And why was it that ecocide was not included in the final draft of the rape statute? Is anybody able to shed a bit of light on the history there? I know we have people here who are experts on the history of the negotiations. So if there's not anyone here in the panel who'd be able to provide a, a good answer, maybe I could invite people to respond to that question down there. Could I just say? Yes. 
a few things. I mean, still there has to be a real, uh, really solid uh, uh, investigation into the history of the Rome Statute. Uh, what I understand is that um, the US, the UK and France, they are, uh, all three are nuclear powers. And they were afraid that the yeah, environmental crime could be also related to the use of nuclear arms. Uh, and they would you know, try to exclude that at all costs. Why the Netherlands went with that, we are not, you know, I'm a Dutchman, we are not a nuclear power, I don't know, but probably it was, you know, because we are all members of NATO and, and we all want to do the same thing uh, when it comes to, uh, to uh, defense policy. Uh, so I think uh, the, the nuclear uh, aspect was one of the reasons why these countries uh, decided not to include um, environmental uh, crime in the Rome Statute in 1998. But again, I really think uh, it should be a great uh, object for a, a PhD by a legal uh, historian uh, to, to, to pursue. There's a question here about the, the process of, of, of amending the Rome Statute. Again, maybe useful to shed some light on that. Um, and that is that, uh, that uh, no amendment ever of the Rome Statute has been accepted with merely a two thirds majority because the amendments that are not expected to be adopted by consensus usually get withdrawn by the submitting country. Is it expected that this will form an obstacle in amending the statute with the addition of ecocide? But please do, if you have thoughts on that, please do answer that. Uh, a question here, given how uncommon prosecutions against corporate executives have been to date generally, why would a new law have any success? Why would a new law under the why why would a new law, a new ecocide law in the International Criminal Court have more success? Any people have thoughts about that? Patrick. Yeah, I, I think it's um it's a really good question. And at, at Global Witness, a lot of our work has been looking at corruption in the extractive sector and the banking sector. And as Charlie referred to earlier on, usually when a prosecution does take place and they're all too rare, the prosecution, in fact, it's not even, it ends up as a deferred prosecution agreement whereby the company pays what to us seems a large fine, but to them is a minimal cost of doing business, like the, the big fine that HSBC paid for laundering Mexican drug money and just under three billion, but nothing to HSBC. Um, and we and others have been, you know, advocating for a long time to get executives in, in the dock. And for example, uh, top executives of both Shell and the Italian uh, oil major Eni are currently in the dock for corruption um, in Milan, um, or corruption in Nigeria tried in Milan. Um, I think that this, when, when the floodgates break when some of these prosecutions start to gain momentum i think more of them will happen and i think the particular power of an eco side law is it's bad enough being in court for corruption it's really bad if you're in court with someone like milosevic or karadic or someone like that someone responsible for nazi type crimes but you're there too you're the pillar of society you're a nice business person but actually you're just a smutty criminal like the rest of them i think that has a real power not just a prosecution but of deterrent Thanks, Patrick. I completely agree. I would just say that if you can credibly characterize a, the, what is happening as being crimes, and you can do so with reference to the Rome Statute and to a new amended law of ecocide, it, it, it has that effect already. Even if it doesn't go any further to the investigation stage, if you're able to, to, uh, to submit an, a, a communication with that, and you're able to put corporations and corporate executives on notice that if they continue to pursue their policies of environmental destruction, that could entail liability under international criminal law. That is a huge deal. Um, and I would not want to understate how important that could potentially be. A huge thank you to everyone who has taken part in this. Uh, all of the very helpful questions and those people who were involved in the organization. And of course, the speakers to Patrick Devouta, to Ravina and to Nina, uh, who is not now here with us. Um, so thank you all. It's been a pleasure.